Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a great opportunity to be able to give a lecture, a tutorial actually, on this new field. So, um, well, first I should mention the people that are involved, and Bart is part of them in some aspect of this work. So there are different people, some in the US, other people that are here from Hasselt, and they are involved in different pieces of what I'm going to present today. Um, but I will try to give a, a full picture of the, the problem. So, <clears throat> as Bart said, my background is really non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And, and therefore, what I'm going to do is tell you what are the, the recent new results that have been obtained in this field. And I think they reached a level of maturity which is sufficient to teach them really now in a tutorial because it's after all not so complicated. Um, and I will try to build this framework, this theoretical framework, and bring it to a point where I can apply it to energy conversion problems. Uh, one example that I'm going to give is thermoelectricity, and the other one is uh, a photoelectric effect. Uh, and this is trying to make contact with uh, the subject of this conference. You might, for people here that are really interested in the very concrete application, you might find this a little bit abstract and theoretical. But I think what is important to realize is that the concepts that are developed in these approaches and simple approaches, the model I'm going to show you will be quite simple. I think they can be interesting to think about more uh, realistic application. But it's always important to identify really what are the key concepts to improve efficiencies um, at the theoretical level so that later on one can start to have a better uh, understanding uh, of how to improve things on more realistic system. So I, I will start <clears throat> the first hour will be mainly on the theory, the framework, and then we will move to application to an energy conversion in the second part, the second hour. Um, and a generic introduction of the motivation for um, these developments in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics is the following. Until, you know, in the last 10 or 20 years, there, there have been huge progress in studying small systems. Uh, experimentally, one can really uh, study them in much greater detail than before. Uh, what is characteristic of small system, uh, these are generic characteristics, one could say. The first one is that fluctuations are much larger. This we know. In large system, fluctuations are very small compared to the mean behavior. In small system, fluctuations become very important. And so it's important to deal with this fluctuation and have a description that can describe these fluctuations. Um, so the average behavior doesn't tell you everything about, you, about your system. You can have a, a, an ensemble of systems that have a certain average behavior, but because things fluctuate so much, it's not really enough to simply say, in average, my system behaves in this way. You have to, to say more, and say more means say how it fluctuates, what is the first, uh, the second moment of the distribution, the third moment, or the full probability distribution of this, this system. Then there is the fact that small systems can be strongly perturbed, and so you can very easily bring them far from equilibrium. And most of the standard theories in statistical mechanics rely on uh, assumptions which are close uh, to equilibrium. So you assume that your system is weakly perturbed, and therefore, you can use perturbation theory around equilibrium. So in small system, we would like to have approaches that can go uh, in the far non-equilibrium regime. Um, and this is an additional challenge uh, of small system. The theory I'm going to present, which is this, can be called stochastic thermodynamics, uni answers uh, in large parts, these two aspects. So we will be able to go far from equilibrium. We will be able to study fluctuations. What can also happen, especially at low temperature, is to have quantum effects. Um, this means that 
traditional stochastic approach, which tend to be more classical, may fail. Um, however, you will see in what sense this can cover quantum dynamics. But at the same time, there are clearly quantum effects which cannot be incorporated in such kind of description. And this, in a sense, goes beyond the topic uh, of this tutorial. But I'm going to show you, however, that this theory, in a certain sense, covers the quantum realm. And I will explain you how. OK, this is the outline. So as I said, in the first part, I will introduce uh, the, this theory of stochastic thermodynamics. And then I will briefly mention the very new result, very exciting results, because these are universal relations which are valid far from equilibrium. But it's a little bit technical. So I will only give you here the broad picture concerning this point B. I will not go too much in the details. If you are interested, you can talk to me afterwards. I can give you references. It, uh, I think it was important to mention them, uh, at least. And then in the second part, I will move to the question of efficiency of energy conversion. And I, I, my plan is to focus mostly on steady state devices, so devices that convert energy without an external time-dependent force acting on the system. Um, maybe if I have time, I will go in the second part I will also say something about systems that are explicitly uh, driven in a time-dependent manner. Um, and the application to thermoelectricity <coughs> and photovoltaics will be in the second part B. OK, so I think it's time to start <coughs> with the introduction of this stochastic theory. So stochastic thermodynamics, as the name suggests, contains stochastics, which refers to the fact that we will consider a dynamic of the system that is stochastic. Uh, and thermodynamics suggests that somehow we have to connect this stochastic description to uh, the thermodynamic description. I will use a formalism which is uh, master equation, stochastic master equation, which are of this form. I will explain you in detail what this means. Um, and I will show you that only by assuming such type of dynamics and making <clears throat> an assumption on these rates, which will be this one, I will go through that in detail, we will be able to show that this stochastic description leads to a, a thermodynamic description. This is a very strong statement and, and a remarkable statement because such type of dynamics, you can find them in finance, in bacterial growth. These are, this can be used really for a lot of systems. And with a single assumption here, we will incorporate the physics. And by putting these two things together, we will be able to build thermodynamics. And this is a very amazing thing. <coughs> OK, so let, let's describe this equation. So, the idea, to have a, a, a concrete picture in mind, we will think of M as the states of a system. Okay, So this is supposed to represent a state. These lines are states uh, of the system. And I, I said here, we will only s consider energy. This is as a starting point to make things simpler. So it means that to each energy uh, to each uh, level M, I, I said the states of the system are labeled by M, so to each of these label, I will associate an energy, and this energy is denoted epsilon of M. Okay? So we have a set of level in the systems, and we have bath that can induce transitions between these states. These states, I represented them you know, with curly curves because I allow for a time dependence of the energy of these states. So in principle, this energy can change. I, I don't restrict myself. I want to be general. So I have a discrete set of states. Each of these states has an energy. And the energy of this state can change according to a force that I externally control and that I will denote by lambda. It's also the lambda that you see here explicitly in the energy. The transitions 
between these states. So what makes the system jump from one of these states to another physically are due to the heat bath, this thermal heat bath, we, because we say the system is not isolated, it's in contact with a heat bath. And the mathematical object describing this transition is the rate matrix. This is the rate matrix. It tells you what is the probability to jump from state M prime to state M due to the reservoir nu. Okay, these are the meaning of all these labels. And as I said, I can have an explicit time dependence in this rate matrix because the energies, I think of them as time dependent quantities. They can change in time. And so this tells me that the, the probability to be on one over these states evolves according to this linear equation. You see, this is a, I can think of this as a matrix acting on a vector of P. This is a standard linear equation, but with time dependent rates. If there are questions, you should ask them because it's important that everybody understands what these basic concepts for a later purpose, okay? Um, okay, so as I said, at this point, it's, it's a purely mathematical description because I said in words that the transition are due to the reservoirs, but I, I didn't give any explicit form for these rates. So in a sense, you could think of this as really a purely mathematical stochastic description that applies to plenty of things. Now I put this second assumption, assumption where the physics comes in. It's called local detail balance assumption. I will assume that the ratio of the probability to jump from a state M prime to a state M due to reservoir nu divided by the probability of having the, this transition in the opposite direction, because now I, I jump from state M to state M prime, this ratio is the exponential of the difference in energy between these two states, okay? What does it mean? I, I, one could really say a lot of things about this because every microscopic theory which will lead to an equation like that, if you do the physics right and you assume as it's usually done that the reservoir are big objects that are always at equilibrium, you will get that as a result of your theory and all the approximation that you need to do, etc., you will get that these rates need to satisfy this condition. In technical term, it is sometimes called the KMS, Kubo Martin Schringer uh, condition. Uh, it's related also to the <coughs> time reversibility of the bath because they are at equilibrium, so they always behave in the same way in the two direction of times. So there are a lot of subtle feature to justify, to understand why we have this property. But here I will, I will ask you to take it as a basic assumption of the theory. This will be our only basic assumption. It means that our baths are always at equilibrium. And by combining this with this, I want to show you now that we will construct a non-equilibrium uh, thermodynamics theory, okay? Some properties of this master equation uh, that are useful are the following. Assume for a moment that I don't have an explicit time dependence. So I, my levels are constant. The energy of this level is constant. I have transitions between these levels, but their energy is constant. I, there is a theorem, Frobenius Perron, you can look it up, but the theorem says if the matrix, that it's a little bit, uh, it looks technical, but it's trivial, is irreducible. Irreducible simply means that each state, there has to be a way to go from one state to another. You can imagine, that's kind of obvious, that if you have a matrix, where basically you have two sets of states, one set communicating with each other, another set communicating with each other, but they don't speak to each other, okay? 
they will never talk to each other, and so there will not be a unique stationary state. But that is kind of trivial from a physics point of view. So the statement for in an irreducible rate matrix simply means that I need to consider states that are connected in, in, that with a possibility of going from each state to another. Okay? If this is satisfied and this makes sense, if not, you can simply separate your matrix in two pieces and treat them separately. So if this is satisfied, you can prove that such an equation has a unique stationary state. So that's very convenient. It's a very important property. And now you can imagine again, this mathematically would require some careful perturbation theory, but physically it's very easy to understand. If you drive, if you have now a time dependence here, but the time dependence which is much slower than the time scale which is needed to reach this stationary state, okay? Because if you don't drive it, it will reach its stationary state. If you drive it very slowly, you can imagine that you will always remain in this stationary state at the instantaneous value of the driving parameter lambda. So it is pretty clear also that for slow driving, your system will always remain in a time-dependent stationary state that depends now parametrically into this external time-dependent force, okay? Um, yeah, the st the, how is steady state defined, I forgot to mention, is, is simply that P dot is zero. No evolution of the probability. We are in a stationary state means that the probability doesn't evolve, it's time independent. <clears throat> and I should also mention this property here, which I forgot to put in the notes that you have. Uh, a, a key property of a rate matrix, and this is, is this one, if you sum over the first index here and over new, all the different bath index, you get one, and you can clearly see why, because if I sum over M here, I, I'm summing up a probability, the change of a probability. Since probability has to be one, the change has, will be zero, and so it's a consequence. It leads, to energy, it leads to probability conservation. It's a key property of the rate matrix to have probability that is conserved. So this is a central property, okay? Maybe to make things a little more concrete, in a sense, I'm not, you should tell me if it, this is trivial and if all of you know these properties, but as a simple example of how such a matrix looks like, if I would consider three states, okay, uh, I label them one, two, three, means I would have a matrix, uh, one, 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 two, one, three, two, three, Two, 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 one, three, one, three, two, three, three. The, this condition of normalization, which gives me the typical structure of a rate matrix, so assuming, I know you don't see it, but, so I will write it again here. Sum over M omega M, M prime has to be equal to zero. When I denote M alone, it means that I sum, this is the sum over the bath index of this matrix here, okay? So this quantity has to be zero, as I said. This is necessary for this matrix to be a rate matrix. So what it means is that I will always have, I can always replace the diagonal element by minus two, one, minus, three, one, because now the sum of these guys are zero, okay? And I can do the same here. And I will do the same here. Okay, so this is a typical structure of a rate matrix. You have positive non-diagonal element that give you the probability to jump from one state to another and the diagonal element is minus the sum of all the other. And this <coughs> is related to the probability to stay 
on a state. It can be interpreted in that way. Okay? Okay, I spent some time on this because it's quite important. Okay, now the key point. How does thermodynamics emerge out of such a description? Well, that, the first thing is the first law of thermodynamics. So it's quite natural to define the energy as the average of the energy of each level with the probability of each of these levels. So this is a simple average in a statistical sense of the energy of each of these levels. This defines me the energy of my system. Okay? That's very natural. Now, the first law should be that the change in the energy of my system has a work contribution plus a heat contribution. The work contribution, if I take the derivative of this thing, obviously I will have two terms, the one with the derivative of the energy, the one with the derivative of the probability. Well, this is, can be interpreted as the change to the energy due to the change of the energy itself, right? The, the fact that if I am on a state, the, time, the external time dependence will make the energy of this state change, but that's due to this external force. So this is, it is natural to call it work because this change is really due to the external force. The heat part is the one, the change in the energy, due to the stochastic transition, so due to the heat bath, because it's the heat bath that generate these transitions. And so this makes perfect sense uh, intuitively to make such a separation. It's very natural. Um, <coughs> now I could further, um, I didn't write it explicitly. Ah, yes, no, okay. Uh, so you see, this is the, this is the sum of all this Q nu. Q nu will be the heat exchange which e with each of the reservoirs. So heat is the amount of energy change due to one reservoir nu. And so I can, this quantity can be written as the sum of a quantity which is this one, which is the heat flowing to the reservoir nu, which has this structure. This is also very intuitive because this is this gives you the probability per unit time to make a transition from state M prime to state M, being on state M prime, so you are on state M prime and you make a transition to state M. The change of energy associated to this transition will be the difference of these two energies, okay? And since I kept the index new here, it's only that bath new that generates this change and therefore it's natural to associate the heat to this reservoir new, okay? So all this quantity perfectly makes sense. It's quite natural <coughs> to define them like that. And so I have a natural way to formulate the first law. Now the second law, I associate an entropy to my system. The entropy will be given by this form. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's the Shannon entropy. Um, and it's the sum over the probability times minus log of the probability to be on state M and average this quantity. So this will be my starting point for the entropy of my system. If I look at the evolution of this quantity S, I can split it in two terms. Before describing the physics of these two terms, let's simply look at how they explicitly look. So this one, which I call entropy flow, is like that. This one, entropy production, is like that. If I sum these two, you see that a log of a product is the sum of each part, right? So I can always separate this log, take the P out. I'm left with the log of this ratio with a plus sign. Here I have the same log of the ratio with a minus sign. So if I sum up these two, these rates here will disappear. I'm left only with this and log the ratio of these two, okay? Now, using this property of the rate matrix that I described before, that the sum 
here over m is zero, I will actually be able to get rid of this guy here because again the log of a ratio I can split as the difference of pm prime and pm and the pm prime part I can sum doesn't depend this one doesn't depend on m so I can sum over m and this contribution drops so I'm only left with this guy that remains and this one this quantity is p dot so I will get actually that this is indeed s dot Okay, so I, it, maybe it was a little bit fast, but you can do this at home. Uh, it was to show you that the sum of these two terms indeed give you S dot. And S dot, because of the property of the log, the only, point that, or the only quantity that will remain is um, P dot log P, because the derivative of log gives you 1 over P, which goes away with this P, and the sum over P dot is 0. Should I do it? Okay, I will do it. Very fast. Okay, S dot. So S is minus KB PM log PM. If I take the derivative of this quantity, I will get this term plus the other one is zero because the other one is the derivative of this one but it's uh, kb pm dot over pm this goes away with this and the sum of p dot is zero so this one is zero okay so you're only left with this one and this one Using the rate equation, you can write as m prime, m prime, sorry, p m prime. And this is precisely that term that I showed you remained out of the entropy production part. Okay? So here, because this, this, and this went away, only this was left, and this is exactly this. So indeed, we have that the sum of these two gives uh, this S dot. This is mathematics, right? Where is the physics now? Well, the physics is there. If I replace this log of the ratio by this crucial local detail balance condition that I gave you before, which was telling me that the log of this ratio is given by the difference of these energies, I am basically summing the, this difference of energies, and as I said on the next slide, on the previous slide, this was precisely the heat. So this contribution to the entropy is called the entropy flow because it contains the heat exchange with the bath. It is sometimes called the reversible contribution to the change of entropy. The other part is that's also something I should briefly mention, but I will not give the full proof because I, I, I think I'm going too slow. Uh, the, the, it's positive, okay? To show that it's positive, this is homework, the central point is to use the fact, yeah, that's a very bad plot, the property that x minus one and this is supposed to be log of x. So the fact, which is quite clear uh, graphically, using this property, using this inequality and the properties of the rate matrix that I gave you, you are supposed to be able to show that this S, S dot quantity, the entropy production, is always positive. It's a little exercise. It's not very difficult. I gave you the key ingredient to show it. Okay? So this is a always positive contribution. And we know from thermodynamics, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, that's exactly what we have usually. We have that the change in the entropy of the system contains one reversible contribution that is expressed as the heat divided by the temperature of the reservoir to which it flows plus an irreversible contribution 
um, that has to be always positive by construction. And this we indeed have here. Now, even more important, the condition to have zero will be that this is one, that this ratio is one. This will be a very important uh, point because this is what will define equilibrium. A, a reversible transformation in the thermodynamic sense is a transformation which keeps this ratio equal to one so that during the transformation, this irreversible contribution is always zero, okay? So we have identified that crucial term that in thermodynamics is always positive or zero if everything is done very slowly at equilibrium. And I, I will go give you the, I will explain this more in detail. So this is really the core of the theory. Once you have that, the, the rest is almost application. And you see at the end, it's not so complicated. So we will consider some specific cases now to get a little bit of feeling of what is going on. Let's simply forget about the external <laughs> driving now. We simply have two baths, okay, with two temperatures, and the system is in between. Can be proved. Now I will stop giving proofs, else we will never end. <coughs> it can be proved that if the two temperatures of each bath are the same, this condition that I mentioned before to, for having entropy production zero, and which is called detail balance, not local detail balance. Local detail balance was this property of the rates. This is detail balance alone, so in a sense global detail balance. This is satisfied. And you can show, so this is the stationary distribution. So we, we suppose we wait a little bit so that the system reaches its steady state and we look at what is going on in the steady state. The steady state satisfies this condition and this can be shown. It's a very easy exercise by assuming this quantity over M. You can show that the stationary distribution is now the equilibrium distribution given by the famous uh, exponential relation which is known from equilibrium, the canonical distribution that all of you know. Okay, so this means if my two baths are at the same temperature, my system is at equilibrium, the steady state of the system is an equilibrium steady state, meaning detail balance is satisfied and therefore its distribution is the canonical distribution. This is what we expect, consistency check. And S dot, this irreversible contribution in the stationary state is zero. What happens now if the two temperatures are different? The detail balance condition will be broken. The stationary state breaks this detail balance condition, which means that in this stationary state, we have an entropy production. And this you can show corresponds to the fact that you have currents flowing through your system if two temperatures are different you have a heat current flowing through your system, and this is why entropy production is positive. Okay, so this was in absence of driving. We have a way to distinguish a non-equilibrium steady state from an equilibrium steady state, which is the equilibrium state. Let's consider now another situation. We have only one bath, but we have now a time, an external time dependent force, okay? This means I don't have to sum over the different heat because I only have one reservoir. So my entropy flow can be written as this heat divided by T. Now, in general, since I know that this quantity is always positive, if I write this as a, I do a transformation in the sense I have my external force doing some change, my system will react to it. Its entropy will change, heat will flow. I can deduce from this, this inequality here, that the change in the entropy of my system is always larger than the integrated heat. This is the Clausius inequality that all of you should be familiar with. Now, what happens if I do everything very slowly? As I mentioned before, if everything is done very slowly, the probability distribution will always be at this instantaneous equilibrium. So instantaneous because it depends parametrically on this driving force, but it's always in that driving, in, in that 
at that value of the driving force in the equilibrium distribution associated to that value of the driving force. And this uh, detailed balance condition is satisfied at every point because I do everything very slowly, much slower than all the processes of relaxation in my system. Then, this, because this is satisfied, entropy production is zero. So the, and the irreversible contribution during this transformation are zero. And I get, this is also a classical result of thermodynamic, that the change in my entropy is given now by the integrated heat. So the integrated heat becomes a state function. It only depends on the initial and the final state. Okay? So this was to show you how this general formalism, so we started with a stochastic description. We used a single assumption on this ratio of the rates, which I called local detail balance. With this, we could construct a first law, a second law, which has no restriction to be close to equilibrium. It's completely general. And in the various limiting case, we find things that we are familiar with. So this shows that everything is consistent and right at that level, okay? So this was the first part concerning uh, this more theoretical aspect of stochastic thermodynamics. Now, in the 15 minutes remaining for this first part, ah, yes, this is, okay, I, I forgot to mention this. Uh, what we, we, we could ask, what did we gain with respect to standard thermodynamics? The crucial point is that we gain time scales because now we have a kinetic description of the underlying processes. So we have really the time scales, if you want, in the, in the, in the thermodynamic description, which we didn't have before. So we can do time dependent or finite time thermodynamics. We have a, a way we put time scale into thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, in principle, has no time scales. And this is why we will be able to study this problem of efficiency far from equilibrium. Um, and now I want, so as I said, I want to spend 10 minutes uh, simply mentioning these recent results concerning fluctuations, okay? I, here I will not go into the details because it's more technical, but I want to give you a hint of what are these new results that made uh, the statistical physics community very happy and excited. So it's called, the, these results are usually called fluctuation theorems. And the central point is that we can reproduce the analysis that we did before at the level of single trajectories. So what we did before was considering averages, right? We had energy was the average energy. Heat was an average current flowing through the system. But now we can define all this quantity that we looked at before, energy, the change of energy, work, heat, entropy, on a single stochastic trajectory. So what means a single stochastic trajectory, if you want to generate uh, the stochastic processes underlying this uh, master equation, okay, you will, so it's useful to make a little picture. This master equation describes the pro the, how probability evolves. But if I would look at a single system and follow it in, the, in time, what I would have, this is time, and here I have my different levels. So let's call them M, M prime. Well, uh, let's, uh, yeah, instead of, so M is equal to one, two, three. And I said the energy can, ev can also change, so I could have things like that. Then in the meantime, this energy level here could have changed also, and I will have a jump. So this is the history of my system. It means that my system was in state two during this time. At this time, it made a jump. 
it stayed in level three during this time, then made a jump to level one again, but while it was on level one, there was a change of energy due to the external force. And this, this thing here, I call a trajectory. It's really one system. I follow it in detail in the course of time. If I do an average over all the possible uh, realization, all the possible trajectory, then I get my description in terms of rate equation where this gives me, this equation tells me how the probability to be on one of these states evolves in time, okay? But these are, yes? It is a, an ergodic process, yes, that's a property of this Markov chain that we are using. So we will have, but this of course assumes that I don't have an external driving force, but if we look at the steady state, we will have coincidence between ensemble averages and uh, time averages, which defines ergodicity, yes. But if there is an explicit time dependence, of course, the notion of ergodicity is a little bit more tricky. But this is a history, okay? And now all these quantities, we can define them at the level of the single trajectory, oops. <laughs> at the level of the single trajectories. And again, we write the first law, so the change of energy along a trajectory can be split into work and heat. The change of energy is a state function. It only depends on the initial and the final point, okay? Because energy depends only on the state of the system. But the work will be the change of the energy while I'm sitting on a level do you see a little bit the blackboard when the light is off? Yes. Not so much. I see people doing like that. <laughs> so let me run. Okay, let me first. Work is the changes of the energy while the system is sitting on a state, and heat is the change of energy due to the bus. So when the system jumps between two states, and now I go back to the picture here, it means that. These changes of energy here, while I'm sitting on the system and energy changes, this is work. This change of energy, this is due to a transition that because the bath is sending me energy so I can jump, this is heat, okay? So these changes are work, these changes are heat. And I can, by summing all this contribution, I will have the heat and the work along the trajectory. So Heat will be the sum of all these jumps, and work will be the sum of all these changes along the segment here, okay? <coughs> I can do the same for entropy, which is even more strange. Uh, well, that's not strange, but entropy is a little bit strange because the quantity that is changing along the trajectory is the probability itself. Again, the change in entropy is only the difference between log minus log p initially and minus log p at the end of the trajectory. And the splitting that I mentioned before can be done also here. I didn't write explicitly the entropy production, but it's very easy to uh, explain the, the, what it means. It will be the probability of the full, probab of the full trajectory forward in time divided by the probability of the backward trajectory in time. So this entropy production at the trajectory level is a direct measure of the time irreversibility, meaning the difference between the probability to observe the trajectory forward in time versus the probability of observing the trajectory backward in time. And the entropy flow is related to the heat flow, again, this was already clear before, I connected entropy flow in average to the heat, so even at the trajectory level, you can show that it, it is a sum of all the heat jumps along the trajectory divided by the temperature of the bath that is causing the, that change, okay? So all this quantity now, 
that I defined before in average, I can define them now at the trajectory level. And the central result is that, let's first look at this relation, which is exact, no assumption of being close to equilibrium, it's valid far from equilibrium. The probability to observe trajectory which have a certain entropy production in time divided by the probability to observe trajectory with, which lead to minus that value of the entropy production is an exponential of this entropy production. You may wonder what the bar means here. It means that when I say bar, and if I, it means that if I have an external time-dependent force, when I define this backward process, the bar, it means I'm time-reversing the external driving force. So if I have an external driving force, this will be the system driven with a certain driving force, this probability will be calculated with the driving force going backward in time, okay? This is the central quantity uh, equation result, but you may wonder what, what do I do with it? And it's not obvious and I will not go into the details, but you have to believe me, out of this relation, we can show a lot of fascinating results. First of all, we can show that the standard um, fluctuation dissipation relation or Onzager reciprocity relation, which are classic results from statistical mechanics obtained when a system is perturbed close to equilibrium, they follow from this relation. We can show, we can get them out of this relation. So it, in a sense, we generalize this traditional result valid close to equilibrium, far from equilibrium. In certain context, this is the context of electronic device, let's make things concrete, where we have two leads at different, uh, uh, with different potential, so that we have a current flowing through the device. This relation can be written in the following way. The probability that in such a device you will observe a current going from higher to lower potential, or Okay, this is what you would expect to be the most likely thing to happen, divided by the probability to have a current in the opposite direction to the bias is related only to the uh, bias in the junction. It is remarkable because no uh, system feature are present in this relation. So these are very detailed quantity, these are specifying very accurately your system, the probability to have a current in one direction. This is a very strong uh, a quantity that in depends very strongly from all the details of your problem. But if you take the ratio of this divided by the probability of minus this current, all the spe system specific things go away and you're left with a universal relation that only contains the bias the non-equilibrium constraint in the system. So this is what makes this relation quite remarkable. They, are, they allow you to tell you that behind the complexity of this probability distribution, if, you want, if I would ask you to calculate this object on a specific system, it's not an easy task. And the P itself, as I said, will depend on many properties of your system. But this ratio is universal. And in another context, this was system between two reservoirs, no external driving force. In another context of one reservoir but an external driving force, one can write this relation as a property of the work fluctuation. So let's say I have, and, and these experiments have been done, actually also on these experiments have been done, where, but on this they had RNA airpin, so it's single molecules that they can manipulate and open with an optical trap. So it's imagine, without going too much in the detail, that you can really take a molecule and this molecule is a hairpin, so it, it has interaction like that, with a 
optical tweezer, you can open this molecule and you can calculate how much work you need to do that. You can close it again and you calculate how much work it takes. And you can repeat the experiment many times. Each time you calculate the work, you can construct the probability that you observe one work in your experiment in the forward process divided by the probability, there should be a bar here, that when you let your molecule close again, you have minus this work. It gives you this very nice relation. And why people got very excited? It's because it's a way to calculate the, the difference in free energy between the closed state and the open state. And so experiments have been done that measure this work on that the single molecule level to calculate the difference in free energy between the open and the closed state. So the message here is this is the central result, but I know like that it looks a little bit formal, but in various cases it can be applied and it has very interesting uh, applications and it's remarkable because it contains most of the known results valid close to equilibrium. But now we have something stronger which is valid far from equilibrium. Okay? Okay, this I think and maybe we can do a, a five minute breaks now and then in the second part I will start with the discussion on the work conversion problems. <laughs>